It's good to see you all here today. You can turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. That's where we'll be. We're going to cover a little bit more ground than is typical, and I'm going to make some longer than typical comments here at the beginning of the message. Um, but I share that with you now so that you know that as we start to work through the text, we'll go at a pretty good pace, I think, once we get going. Um, but because of that, <clears throat> I want to go ahead and just right here off the bat go to the Lord and ask for his guidance, for his help. Father, we have come to a really important uh, passage in this book of Acts as it gives us an account of a very historic event in church history. I ask that you would help us not just to see this as an interesting detail in history. I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would help us to see your heart in this passage. That in these key moments in history, you have made yourself known. And that the work you did on that day has continued for nearly 2,000 years since then. And Lord, as we are witnesses in a world that does not like the testimony all the time that, that you have tasked us to give. I pray that we would find in this passage both comfort and wisdom. Comfort in knowing that you are in control, that you in the end will accomplish your will, but also wisdom in knowing that you have called us to participate in that plan. So I pray that you would help us to understand the task that is before us, that you, you would help us to learn from those that have gone before us, and that we would be better ambassadors, better witnesses, more faithful followers of Jesus. And as Father, we go into the rest of the season with, as I've already mentioned, a lot of hope, a lot of joy, but also at times some griefs, that you would use moments like this to to fill us with a deep satisfaction in who you are, knowing these, the deep truths in life. May you be glorified here today, and may your people be built up. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I shared from you since the beginning of the book of Acts that I see, as many others do, chapter 1, verse 8, as sort of the outline of the entire book. It's Jesus speaking there, and he says to his disciples, you will be my witnesses first in Jerusalem, and then in Judea and Samaria, and then finally the outermost parts of the earth. Very good. And that's basically where we are. We're in the third section of that outline. We are seeing the power of the Holy Spirit being poured out in the lives of faithful followers of Jesus. Now, both Acts 1-8 and my little cute statement there about the book of Acts, they both beg a question. Well, we are witnesses of what? What is it to which we're giving testimony? That the Holy Spirit is being poured out on faithful followers of Jesus for what? What is the end? What is the purpose? What's our message and, and what are we here to do? As we get into Acts 15, what we've been looking at throughout this book is the first 15 years of church history. Recorded for us in the book of Acts, it has been a document of the supernatural empowerment of the followers of Jesus to testify, to bear witness to the message of salvation in and through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Often that message has been authenticated by miraculous signs. And of course, that message has as its chief sign the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that fact, that sign, as a validation of the message, is one of, if not the chief reason, that when we think of sharing the gospel, we call it witnessing. 
We are bearing testimony to what we have seen and heard. That's the way it's always been. This first generation of witnesses did not operate as a marketing agency for Jesus, but as agents of reconciliation. They offered to all who would listen to the message a pathway to peace between sinful men and a holy God. We can see them as more like operatives in God's grand scheme of redemption project. Reclaiming the once disinherited nations, bringing them back into his family, and rescuing the individual from the penalty of sin. Where prodigal sons and daughters, by the mercy of the Father's acceptance of the shed blood of Jesus, adopts them into his family. Peter, John, Stephen, Philip, <coughs> the Ethiopian eunuch, Paul, <coughs> Barnabas, and many other heroes that we've already got acquainted with in these first 15 years of church history. They're all very unique. They have different stories to tell. They all have uh, a different background and a different kind of testimony of how God brought them into his family. But even though there's a diversity of background and uniqueness to each of their messages, they are united in their plea. Announcing that there is no lasting hope to be found other than in Jesus Christ. In your rebellion, you will only find death. Whatever power you may attain, whatever pleasures you have joyed, they will expire. And in the end, you will stand before a holy judge. And only one plea will rescue you, you from his righteous wrath on that day. It is not your family heritage. It is not your social standing. It is not your accomplishments. It is not your wealth. It is not your good works, as impressive as they may seem to you and those around you. The only plea that will rescue you on that day is if you can plead the blood of Jesus. And they had great confidence in this message because they had seen the risen Jesus. It was proof to them that Jesus was who he claimed to be. Son of God and son of man. As God, he is the only one who has the power, the only one in the universe with the power that could achieve such a feat. And yet as man, the only kind of being qualified to stand in the place of man as his representative. And because he died and rose again, they knew that it worked. That God's plan could not be thwarted. No devilish scheme would stand in the way of the expansion of of God's family and the kingdom of his beloved son. No foolishness of men could not be overcome if the rebel of God would but receive his grace and do but one thing, plead the blood of Jesus. Receive his grace, which alone has the power to save the sinner. And by the time we get to Acts 15, we have seen the power of that message unleashed on the world. The truth of God's word has been proclaimed. The beauty of God's heart for those in peril has been on relentless display. And on the fundamental goodness of his work 
in the world that cannot be assailed. That is, you can't not see it. But that doesn't mean the devil's quit. And that doesn't mean that men have stopped rebelling against God. And so, after a mere 15 years, false teachers have arisen. And they threaten to undermine the message of salvation by grace alone. And they are now urging the people to instead embrace works of the law as essential for salvation, <laughs> as a requirement for membership in the family of God. Now, it turns out, as we'll see, that this is not just a secondary issue. It is so essential to the gospel message that this rapidly growing, world-transforming, Holy Spirit-empowered church will gather to have its first great council. And there they will discuss and decide on a matter of essential Christian <clears throat> orthodoxy. It wasn't invented by Constantine or anyone else. The stakes on this occasion could not be higher. In one sense, we can see it as a united kingdom of priests and service of God that are in peril of a disastrous division. In another, perhaps even more important sense, the purity of the gospel message is on the line. And if that message gets compromised, souls will be lost. Prodigal sons and daughters will die in the muck of their own making. The blind will not see. The broken will not be healed. And the lost will not be found. The purity of the gospel message is online, is online, on the line. And the unity of the church hangs in the balance. And so on this occasion, its leaders have assembled in this holiest of cities for an event that is no mere blip on the radar. I want you to understand that. This is a monumental day in church history. The first thing we see, beginning of verse 1, is that dissension arises. <clears throat> there is a great debate which precedes and leads up to the great council. Now, it's important to understand that in Acts 15, it picks up near the, right at the end of 14, and we are... <clears throat> at the beginning of chapter 15, still in Antioch, which is in Syria, north of Jerusalem. So the occasion that leads up to the Jerusalem council begins with a debate that, be, that is taking place north of there in Antioch. And that's sort of the home base of operations for Paul and Barnabas, who have just returned from this incredible missionary journey. And here's what we read in verse 1. <clears throat> But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers. Now, I'll stop there just for a moment. I, I told you Syria was north of Jerusalem. And we read that some men came down from Judea. And you go, what? Uh, we've covered this before. But that's, that's the way the, the writers in, in, in this world would talk about Jerusalem. Whenever you leave Jerusalem, whatever way you're going, you're coming down from Jerusalem. It's a sign of reverence. Uh, um, and of, of the holiness of that city. So even though they're going from Jerusalem to Syria and Antioch north, they're coming down from Judea. So they left uh, the holy city to go up to Antioch because they probably heard some things. And it says here that they were teaching the brothers. So they came with an agenda. They came with their own message. And here it is. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That, do you remember reading that in Paul or Barnabas's message? Or Peter's? No, I, I don't. In fact, I heard the exact opposite. So this is, this is a big deal. They are immediately attacking 
the essential core doctrine of salvation by grace alone, saying that unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension, figures, and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So I pause here just for a moment to reflect. Paul and Barnabas can hold their own. We've seen that clearly. You don't want to go toe-to-toe with Paul and Barnabas. They're probably going to win the debate every time. But they take this issue seriously. They understood that they've come from Jerusalem. And so even though they probably held their own and did a pretty good job um, protecting their own flock in, in, in Antioch, they go, you know what? This matter is really important. And so we're going to take it seriously and we're going to go talk to the elders in Jerusalem. So they take it very seriously. So they go. It says, verse 3, so being sent on their way by the church, they pass through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. So I love this too. It's like, I wonder what the spirit of that was, but they're on their way to Jerusalem, but, but they don't, you know, they make sure to stop along the way. They're sort of creating a buzz almost. You know, we got to tell our story as we're going, hey, we're going to visit Christians in these lands and we're going to let them know too about what we've been doing in the last couple of years taking the gospel to the Gentiles. It's been amazing. And of course, we see that as they share this message, their testimony, it brings great joy to those that hear the message. I think this is an important detail because it shows us that even though the church is at this great moment of tension, it's not like it's 50-50. It seems to me that actually for the most part, the church is in a good place, but some very influential false teachers have arisen. So we have something of a, a consensus and a healthy one. As they share their testimony, it brings great joy to all the brothers. Verse 4, when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. So again, they arrive to Jerusalem, and the first thing they do is just, hey, you know, it's not, hey, we got to settle this debate. Why don't you send me, you no, know, it was nothing like that. Immediately they get there and they just tell them their story. You need to know what God has been doing. And I love, and I commented on this last week. This is the second time we see this. They declare all that God had done with them. They see themselves as just an instrument for God to do with them as he pleases. I love that sense of how they understand the call on their lives. They are available for God to do with them what he pleases. Verse 5, but some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. So that paragraph sort of is bookended with a very clear identification of what the false teaching is and who is doing it. In the first verse, we read that it's this party, or it says some men came down from Judea, and they are identified there at the end that they belonged to the party of the Pharisees. And this is more than likely the same party that had vocalized an objection early in the book of Acts when Peter had this incredible ministry to Cornelius. And it was somewhat similar. Cornelius had been a recipient of, of the gospel, even though he was Roman. And Peter was the one there who, through his great vision, had been instructed by the Holy Spirit to to say, you know what, the gospel is not just for Jews anymore. And, and we know that he wrestled with the vision. It didn't, it didn't click with him all at once. But as he sought to be faithful to God, where he went where he was told to go and said what he was told to say, and as the Holy Spirit was poured out in Cornelius and his family and so on, it began to click for him. And Peter himself began to think differently about the real implications of the gospel and it was Peter who had reached this conclusion that the gospel, this message about who God is, about who Jesus is, what he had done, was not just for Jews. It was for men of every nation. And the same people that voiced opposition to that are at it again. They probably caught wind of what Peter, I'm sorry, what Paul and Barnabas have accomplished, and they're not too pleased. <laughs> 
And so, of course, it caused no small dissension. They get into a raucous debate, I can only imagine. They make their trip down. They get to Jerusalem. They share the story along the way and both when they arrive. But the crux of the matter that they've come here to address is summarized there at the end. Their claim that it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. And verse 1 made it clear that they saw this as a matter essential to salvation. So, so the, the debate here is not whether or not law keeping is good. The debate here is whether or not we are saved by keeping the law. That's an important distinction that we often forget about when we have this debate in our modern day. That anyone who says we are saved by grace alone through faith alone is not saying that good works don't matter. They're just being very clear that good works do not save you. Salvation does not come by works of the law. So, we get to verse 6 and some discussions are led. We see Peter first, then Paul and Barnabas, then James who sort of take turns. They all have different speaking parts. We'll go through them one at a time. Verse 6, Peter is the first one to speak here. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So there's Peter summarizing his own experience with this kind of thing, that God had used him to bring salvation to Gentiles. Verse 8, and God, who knows the heart, bore witness. That is, God says this. By giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. I note first that the discussion begins with this description that much debate was taking place. And I like this because it reminds me that debate can be a good thing. It may not be the two-sided talking head thing you see on the news at night. But there is a kind of debate that is good, that is rational exchange of ideas that are logical and sound and based on the authority of God's revealed truth. That's a good thing. And, and we see a certain kind of discipline and an order to the way they go about addressing this issue that becomes clearer and clearer as we work. They, they are, we know that God is at work at the same time, they have not shirked their own responsibility to use the brains that God gave them to search the scriptures and bring them to bear on the issue at hand. A lot of commentators think that there may have been a sequence of, of sort of private meetings that eventually expanded over time. It's very possible that something like that happens, but eventually it seems pretty evident that this became a public discussion. Putting lines on to where exactly those transitions are is a little bit difficult to do. But it does look like there's some bit of sort of a, a meeting, a, a bigger group, and, and so on and so forth. That there was an order and some sophistication involved here. But the basic logic of the argument that they put forth, as articulated here first by Peter, is summarized there in verses 8 through 10. And it's basically, you know what? If God did not require any additional qualifications for salvation, neither should the legalists. He's making very clear, God is the one who spoke. God is the one that made this clear. God, the Holy Spirit, was poured out on these believers. That's God saying they're mine. We don't get to add to what God has said. So God has made it clear, and we ought not stand in the way. We have no business adding qualifications to salvation where God has not put them. And of course, he sort of tells the story in the early days, by my own mouth. I, too, have been used by God to bring this gospel message to the Gentiles. And this thing that Paul and Barnabas have been doing the last couple of years is amazing, but it didn't originate with them. That's important because if there was any sense of a schism that maybe was perceived, like, you know, that Peter was on one side of the theological <clears throat> issue and that Paul and Barnabas were on the other, that's just simply not true. 
they certainly probably thought a little bit different here and there. We could say, based on everything we know, they definitely had different strengths and weaknesses, different passions. Sure, we could bring some of those things into our understanding of, of how they were different in some way. But fundamentally, they were united on the implications of the gospel. So Peter himself had participated in this ministry. And I love this phrase here. And looking back to an event about 10 years prior, he says uh, about these conversions of the Gentiles, that God having cleansed their hearts by faith. That's a phrase that he didn't use back in Acts 10 and 11 which suggests to me that now Peter's theology is beginning to get a little bit more refined. He's reading back, in a sense, into that experience of a more robust theology. And we know that in Acts 10 or 11, he was figuring it out. And in time, it's become clearer for him. So his perspective on what God did with him in Cornelius and all the, the individuals in that story has improved over time and has clarified over time. And he now understands that salvation came to them because God cleansed their hearts through faith. That's Peter's message. And from Peter, we briefly get to hear from Paul and Barnabas. Verse 12, And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So they simply tell their story. They did it in Samaria and Phoenicia. They did it when they got to Jerusalem. And now they do it to the entire assembly that's gathered here. And, and we get the sense that people are pretty amazed. And the, and the idea, I think, here for the reader is that God's demonstrating what he's trying to say through the miraculous feet as sort of a way of authenticating that message. It, it's hard to ignore the fact that God has used Paul and Barnabas in a mighty way. So as they share this testimony, it, it's like, how else do you explain that but God? From Paul and Barnabas, we come to James. Let's go ahead and read all of his words here, beginning in verse 13. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take them from a people for his name and return. Sorry. And with his words of the prophets agree, just as, as it is written, after this I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from old. Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. The James here is not the apostle. It is the half-brother of Jesus, who was a post-resurrection convert. He was operating, it appears, as something of a lead pastor of the Jerusalem church. And because he was not one of the original apostles, this is someone who has grown up over these last 15 years and risen, we might say, into a position of leadership because he's been maturing, growing, a certain kind of giftedness and blessing of the Lord upon him. Those kinds of things probably would have been in motion. He's, he's we might say, risen up the ranks. He, he didn't begin this way. So he speaks very much like a pastor in some ways. He, he does hear what preachers do. They bring the word of God to bear on the issue at hand. It's, it's James, the half-brother of Jesus, lead pastor of the Jerusalem church, who begins to exposit the word in order to understand the issue that they've come here to debate. So he quotes the prophet Amos and Isaiah. It's mixed a little bit. And he's basically servicing a basic point with Amos and Isaiah, which is essentially, you, you know what? This has always been God's plan. This isn't new. It didn't originate with Paul and Barnabas. It didn't originate with Peter. This has always been a part of God's plan. That God has had as part of his plan to restore national Israel and to bring salvation to the Gentiles. This is nothing new, and he uses the scriptures to prove his point. Now, that sounds simple enough. 
And at its essence, that's about all that you can say is clearly the case. Uh, his use of Amos in this passage is famously complicated and confusing. And we're not going to go too deep into it because I don't have the, the ability to. Uh, and, and literally, this is the work. This is like the kinds of things people do dissertations about. Um, but I'm going to expose some of the nuance here to you um, because I think that looking over these things just briefly will, in the long run is going to help you become a better student of God's word. We'll come back to something that we can take away and be confident about. But I want you to see that there are some complexities in this issue. I also don't like to ignore things like this because I don't want you discovering them in some random place and thinking, oh, no, well, everything's falling apart. This is, couldn't be God's word and all that kind of thing. No, they're there. Let's acknowledge that and let's think a little bit through these things. It's easy enough to find the verse that he's referring to. It's in the book of Amos. You could find it. You could go back in Amos and you could read it. And you would go, oh, yeah, that's definitely what he was quoting. However, it's a lot different. It's really similar, but clearly different. Mm. Like, if I just read Amos first, I might not reach the same conclusion that he reached in Acts, what's going on here? Now, we've talked about this before, but we know that, of course, the, the Old Testament was written primarily in Hebrew. But at this point in history, most of God's people in, in the Greek-speaking world were reading the Septuagint, which was a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And it appears that his quotation here of the passage is, is taken more from the Septuagint than from the Hebrew text. Because sometimes, this is something that happens in translations, things get lost in translation. Most of the time, it, it's not earth-shattering, but occasionally, oh, this is really different. So he's referring here not to the original, but to the Greek translation. So that's issue number one. Issue number two is that he doesn't even quote that very accurately and appears to add some commentary, which means he's actually interpreting the passage, not quoting the passage. And then finally, this isn't James's letter, this is Luke's. So what we have here is Luke's summary of James's interpretation of the Greek translation of the Hebrew prophets. Okay? Those are all layers that we want to be sensitized to when we look at passages like this. Now, I won't, I won't go into all of these things, but one of the things you might notice is, is the word booth in one version and the word tent in another. Well, if you know your Bibles well, whenever you see the word tent, you probably think tabernacle. And you think about a place of worship and things of that sort. And this is one of the things where going with the Greek translation which we understand historically why the translators used that word, but it was probably not the best word. That the original word was this idea of booth or house. And so if he was thinking the way Amos was when he wrote it, he would have been thinking more about the house of God, not the, that is his household, his family, rather than his place of worship. It's, it, it's a little bit of a different thing. And it appears that the way James riffs on this and this is going to really, this is going to be a struggle for some of you. Might not be literal, but more metaphorical. Because it appears that in his mind, he's thinking of Jesus as the house of David. So when he's talking about this work, he, he's seeing Jesus as the metaphorical interpretation, fulfillment of this passage. Now, sometimes in the Bible, when we read prophecy and other things, it's really easy to figure out, is this literal or metaphorical? Like, when Jesus says, I am the door, we don't go, oh, Jesus is made of wood, turns on hinges and squeaks. We get that. When we read the book of Revelation, we go, what? Right? And I want to caution you and anyone else about saying that I know all the time, it's always easy to figure out, is this literal? Is this metaphorical? Sometimes it's not so easy. Here's what I want to caution you with as a student of God's word. Do not allow your commitment to a system or a tribe of theological thinking to get you to overcommit. Now let me unpack what I mean by that. You know, 
We, we have 2,000 years, not just of church history, but theological development. And so we live at a time and in a place where people like to say, not just I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm a Calvinist. Right? I'm, I'm an Arminian. Or they'll go, I'm a cessationist. I'm a continuationist. I'm a this. I'm a that. There are all these issues that we, that we separate on. And it's like, you're either this or you're that. Now, those are worthwhile discussions. I'm not saying we shouldn't discuss them at all. But what happens is that often our loyalty to that system of thinking forces us to read that into a passage, and it should go the other way around. So what happens is passages like this tend to confront the reader with his own assumptions about the way prophecy works, about his own systems, and things of the sort. I've seen people who are... You know, have a particular eschatology and end times view about the timing of the millennium and all these things, force that into this passage and say, this is what it means. And then I've seen people who have different, commist- different commitments in their system going, no, 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 no. This is what James meant by the use of this passage. And I'm just here to say, I don't care <laughs> which system is right in that instance. I do care because these, these issues do matter. But what I care about most is the text, and you should too. And I'm, I'm okay with saying on occasion, I'm not sure exactly what he's getting at. You know, even little things like this. You would read in Amos, Edom, and you would read in the New Testament, mankind. Which is it? Edom, a person, a, a nation, or mankind. Little things like this. You, you know how the confusion began? Well, you know that a lot of times the, the old manuscripts in, in Hebrew, they just have the consonants, right? The consonants for Edom and the consonants for Adam, they're identical. And the word Adam translates mankind. It's a very honest mistake that a transla- translator would have had in there. But the original prophecy was about a nation that God was bringing into his family. And this changes the the sense of of the way that James is saying this has been fulfilled. In the Amos sense, it's God seeking the lost, those who have abandoned the family of God and bringing them back in. God's the seeker going and getting the lost. But in the Septuagint translation, it's sort of the other way around, where it's the lost seeking God. Which one is it? I don't know. <laughs> in, in the mind of Amos, it was the former. But in the mind of James, based on his interpretation of the Greek translation of the Hebrew text, he apparently saw it both ways. So, why go into all that? Because I want you to be a careful thinker of God's word and understand that when something appears to be a contradiction or upset your commitment to a system, know that there's a lot of times a lot going on that you don't know the first time you look at a passage. The lesson, if you will, take this and then we'll move on, is there's always a lot more to it than you realize at first. And and that simple fact is actually a comfort to me because I do encounter things sometimes when I go, hmm, I don't know if I get that. Or I'm not sure if I even like that. Have you ever found that? You read through something in the Bible and you go, "Mm, God, are you sure? Well, again, the way we often work through those kinds of passages, it takes a lot of work. And I'm just trying to say there is almost every time I've put in the work to do it, a really amazing answer. There's a lot going on here and it makes it complicated. And I look forward to settling these debates on the other side of glory. But... I can give you something of of clarity before we move on. Here's what's clear in James' interpretation of the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. That God's ultimate plan, that his ultimate plan is for far more than the nation of Israel. It includes a a plan, a commitment to the nation of Israel. They, They maintain a special place in his overall scheme. And we can see that God will keep his commitments to Israel, but at the same time, he's doing something so much bigger. Lastly, before we move on, what James offers, so what he concludes is that, you know, here's what we want to say. Let's be clear on the issue of salvation. We're, not, we're saved by grace through faith, 
Those are obviously Paul's words from Ephesians, but they're, they're on point, same message. But let's urge them to do these four things. He gives them four, do these things. Why these four? Why these four? To abstain from things polluted by idols, that's one. And from sexual immorality, two. And from what has been strangled, that's three. And from blood, that's four. Well, this is cool. If you go back to Leviticus 17 and 18, I know you love reading through Leviticus. You'll find that those two chapters deal specifically with the issues of wisdom related to being worshipers of Yahweh in a pagan culture. And, and those two chapters were very much about, here's how you ought to comport yourselves when you find yourself in that situation, which is exactly the situation that the church is in at this point in history. The followers of God, the worshipers of Yahweh and of Jesus Christ have found themselves in a pagan culture and they need wisdom on how to live in that setting. And so James, knowing his scriptures, appeals not just to the law in this instance, but to the wisdom contained in the law for how we ought to find guidance in living and operating in a situation just like it. So he gives them these four prohibitions. What you would find is that all four of those prohibitions are found in Leviticus 17 and 18 and in that exact order. So very clearly, he's appealing to the wisdom of that passage. So what we find here is not a, yeah, you're saved by, by grace and not the law, but follow the law for salvation. No, he's saying, no, let's be clear. Salvation is not about works of the law, but you will do well is the phrase he uses. If you do these things, you will do well. That's a statement about the wisdom of enacting these policies where they go. Follow these rules as an act of wisdom, not as a matter of salvation. And it's also an issue of more of fellowship, not of salvation. That's important to understand. So he's offering them wisdom for how to live as lights in a pagan culture. Three of them come from more ceremonial aspects of the law which would have been about making sure that they live in a distinct manner, that they stand out, that they do not look like the pagans around them. And this was about not practicing like them, worshiping like them, looking like them, sounding like them. You should stand out wherever you go. That's what it meant then, and it's more than likely what it meant at this time as the, those practices were still quite prolific. But one of those four is also a moral issue. And it's interesting to me that, that James makes, you know, this very clear. And I, I do think it stands out for, for a reason. That sexual sin is unique. The, there's this false idea that all sin is the same. Wrong. All sin has in common that it is sufficient to put you in the place of condemnation before a holy God. But not all sin is the same. And not all the sin is equally offensive. There is something unique about sexual sin. Paul makes this clear. Peter makes this clear. Here James, I think, makes this clear. That one of the, the most common tricks of the devil to knock you off course is to lure you away with your lust. And so it is essentially a matter of wisdom, not of salvation. He's not saying if you fornicate, you can't be saved. But it is an essential matter of Christian discipleship that you walk in purity, sexual purity in particular. It will lure you away. And it will compromise your testimony. It is, it is a unique struggle for us all. And all the writers of the New Testament seem to recognize that fact. Be careful. And if you know, you, you could be completely ignorant about what's going on in the world. And you would still know just how prevalent this kind of idolatry is is in our own culture. That sexual sin is pervasive. It is, we call it perverted for a good reason. Because it subverts and perverts God's design for a holy institution to image God, to reflect him, to teach, and to bring pleasure to his people as they embrace institutions that he himself authored. This isn't a sex is bad talk. This is a sex is precious and it should be taken care of kind of message. 
Finally, this decision is rendered, and what is basically a review of what he said publicly is now put in writing. And he says in verse 22, Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, hey, we didn't send them, we didn't authorize it, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. And that's where the order follows what was found in Leviticus 17 and 18. If you keep yourself from these, you will do well. Farewell. He does not say, if you keep these, you will keep your salvation. If you do these, you will do well. It is a matter of wisdom. How do you live as a follower of Jesus Christ in a pagan culture? Here's some things. You shouldn't look like them. You shouldn't worship like them. Talk like them. You should stand out. I'm calling you to something higher. And isn't it great? Unity! That's the fallout. The church is unified. We see apostles and elders, and yes, the whole church, having put their stamp of approval on this resolution that James had proposed. And there's no record here uh, of the Judaizers repenting, but their influence, at least temporarily, is sort of snuffed out. The church is of one accord. There's that phrase again. They, and, and, and the Judaizers remain in the minority. So, so the, the fallout of this great council is not a 50-50 split. They take a clear stand against a powerful but vocal minority, and they put it down. And the elders, the apostles, and the whole church are of one accord, saying this is the way it is. We must be clear on matters of salvation, that we are saved by grace and by grace alone. As followers of Jesus, batters of wisdom will require us to follow certain laws, and we want to promote godly and wise living, but not at the expense of compromising the gospel message. So Paul and Barnabas returned to Antioch with the blessing of the Jerusalem church, Judas and Silas go with them as, as being in their company, I think, as a sign of unity, that the church in Jerusalem and the church in Antioch are on the same team, as it were. And, and at this point, whatever success the Judaizers had in Antioch is, is just being utterly dismantled. And so we finally read in these last few verses, a disaster has been averted. Verse 30 so when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. See, they took a stand, and the brothers were encouraged by that. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. I wish maybe that Luke had recorded that message for us. That would be cool, but he didn't. But it had an impact. The brothers were encouraged by it. Verse 33, And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others. Awesome. So, disaster averted. The church proceeds after its first great debate with great unity. Clarity on the gospel message an unwillingness to compromise on the exclusive claims that the church has made up to this point, that there is no hope apart from Jesus Christ, 
that there is no salvation apart from his shed blood, that by works of the law, no man will be justified in the sight of God, only cleansed hearts that are cleansed by faith. Only men and women who have been declared righteous because of the righteousness of Christ put on their account. There is only one plea. The blood of Jesus Christ. And the church sees this not as a secondary issue, not as a agree to disagree kind of issue, but as an absolutely fundamental, essential matter of Christian orthodoxy. You get this wrong, you get the gospel wrong. And as I said before, souls are lost and they stay lost. The blind don't get their sight, the broken don't get their healing. This is absolutely essential. And I hope for you it's not difficult to see how that might apply to us today as the siren call is all over us, both from outside and within the four walls of the church to compromise the message of the gospel, to make it more palatable, more appealing, more marketable, spending millions of dollars to communicate to a lost public that he gets you or he gets us. But, but that is the message that we need to be clear about. The message we need to be clear about is who God is, who Jesus is, what he did, and that he alone provides the solution for us, a pathway to peace with God. This matters now every bit as much as it did then. And I'm grieved, and I hope you are too on some level as you see this compromise creep into the church. I, I do believe that there are a lot of issues. You know, we live in a pretty, I'll say toxic, even though that word is overused, uh, kind of environment. People like to debate over finer things and just separate over things that they really don't need to separate. And, and I can't at times throw my voice in the lot of it and say, let's, let's have unity. Let's agree to disagree. You know, I try to show you some of that in looking at James's quotation of the Old Testament there. That there's, you might read scholars and people who are going to have a different take on it. I can, I can get involved with that. But there are some things that we cannot compromise on. We just can't. And this is one of them. And, and this was not a decision that the third or fourth century church made because it wanted to craft a narrative, a social narrative. This wasn't about power and institutionalizing it and oppressing the people. This, none of that narrative that we hear about the church and all of its councils, the many that will come after this, are true. Fifteen years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ gathers to declare, going forward, we must be clear, this is a matter of essential teaching, that no man will be saved apart from the work of of Jesus Christ. His shed blood is the only hope, the only plea that we will have before a holy God, and by works of the law, no one is justified. That's 48 AD. Not 313 or 319 or whatever it is. It is the gospel truth. And we must not compromise on it. That will cost you and me a good reputation in society, popularity, friends, and family. But these witnesses have counted the cost and they are willing to pay it. Because getting that message out brings many sons to glory. Getting that message out means God's plan goes forth, his family grows, his kingdom expands. And that's what we're here to do. Father, I pray that you would help us to maintain that clarity, that commitment to the things that really matter. We recognize that there are some issues that are complicated. We recognize that there are issues that are, they could be silly distractions. And we recognize that there are issues that maybe are unclear but still important. 
But more than any of that, Lord, I want to recognize that some matters are not up for compromise. They're not up for reimagining. It isn't time for us to move on or, 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 or be, say we've become enlightened and we need to change the message. This is the message. Father, I pray that you would give us the courage to stay on that message, to not compromise. Lord, I realize that many of us struggle on some level with what that looks like in everyday life. To what point are we called to, to imitate these people here to go about preaching the gospel? How explicitly are we to do that? And I know that one of the reasons that's so complicated is because so many of us are struggling with it in our own lives. And Lord, I know that there may be fear involved. I know that we may have our doubts about our ability to communicate that message. I know that we may think that maybe we'll embarrass God or we won't do it well or anything like that. Lord, I want to ask for those of us who are still paralyzed with all those kinds of things that you would bring relief. That you remind the follower of Jesus who is still sometimes face down in the mud. That his father, that her father is at home, missing him, missing her. And that if he would go back, to slaughter the fatted calf. Father, confront us with the relentless and unmerited mercy of God. And those of us, you know, maybe among us, there's some who have grown up in the church. We made the commitment, we raised the hand as a child, and we never look back. And the temptation for us is to look on all those who have wandered, squandered the fortunes of the Father, and be angry. To think we should get in your face and say it's not fair. Look at me. I didn't do it. I didn't go there. I didn't waste it. Forgive the self-righteous among us. Lord, this thing happened back in all these years probably because of that very thing. And it was to the Pharisees that Jesus himself was very clear that he did not come to save the righteous, but the sick. And if we understand the truth about what God has said, that he has called all to repentance, that the point he was making was, you're all sick. Don't make the mistake of thinking that you are exempt from the need to repent. So, Father, I ask that you would grant to us all a spirit of repentance, of reliance on you, that you would change our hearts and our minds, that you would give us courage and passion and strength to endure whatever faces us. Father, as we seek to pursue faithfulness to you in our private lives and as a church, I ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us and in this place, not so that we can say, look at us, but so that we can say, look at God. As we enter the season, may we sing the song of Mary. My soul magnifies the Lord, for he has done great things for me. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.